This rat here looks like a fairly typical fungus, though what this and other related taxa do when it comes to spreading and maintaining their existence is something both profoundly interesting and also disturbing. So much so, we've even made a whole series on it, The Last of Us, which went over how such a thing could come to be in people. How valid that is, and how it actually works in more, will be discussed here, in which I'll be going over parasitic fungi and how they affect the host in the ways that they do, and to what ends. To gain some background, Cordyceps, the genus of fungi shown at the start of the video, alongside the closely related Ophiocordyceps, is quite diverse, having about 600 known species, and are notable in that a majority of them are endoparasites, with them living inside of and also influencing the host, which includes a variety of insects and other arthropods. They are mainly found in tropical forests, with them being most commonly found in a range of Asian countries, notably China, Japan, Bhutan, Korea, and Thailand, with them also being found in Brazil and Australia. When it comes to reproducing, these fungi release spores, which can travel a good distance away from them, and each have a chance of coming in contact with an insect. If a lucky spore manages to land on an insect, in this case a fly, the spore will germinate, and its hyphae, thread-like filaments, will begin to grow, being able to weave into and inside of their exoskeleton. From there, their mycelium, the root-like structures of the fungi, will begin to take hold, using the hapless insect's body as an incubating region for more cordyceps to germinate from within them, replacing the insect's tissues with their own as they continue to grow. From there, the cordyceps will germinate from within the host, producing more spores which will then continue to cycle around through the environment, all with the chance of coming into contact with another insect and continuing the cycle. These fungi are very diverse, with up to 600 species, and as such, many of them are hyper-specialised to affect on certain species of insects, which allows for there to be less competition between them, while also at the same time limiting the options for a good many of them when they release all their spores. As well as cordyceps, there is also ophiocordyceps that also infects insects, though, throughout history, their classification was quite confusing as to whether or not they should be placed in the same genus. After some molecular testing in 2007, it was found that the family of Clavicepitaceae should actually be split into three distinct monophyletic families, with these three being the ones that were created. Of the different species of Ophiocordyceps that were recognised, some are quite unusual, with some species specialising in inhabiting caterpillars, with them eventually erupting out of their head like a horn and others that pump cicadas full of hallucinogens which causes parts of their abdomen to fall off. The most well known of these fungi though, is the species Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which primarily targets ants, in many instances making up to 70% of a rainforest invertebrate life, and makes them go through a very strange process. Mainly affecting carpenter or bullet ants, these fungi, like in other cordyceps species, release their spores into their environments, and with them coming into contact with an ant, then begin to germinate and spread throughout the host body. Once attached, their hyphae pierce through the ant's exoskeleton to infiltrate them, using enzymes like lipase and chitinase to do so. Once entered, it then propagates its fungal cells throughout their body, and doing so in an interesting manner. From studies done on these fungi and how they affect ants, analysis of ultra-thin slices from infected ants and then recreated using 3D modelling, shows in vivid detail as to what parts remain a part of the ants and which parts become taken over by the fungus. At the cellular level, there was expectedly found to be a high percentage of fungal cells in the ant's body, though their concentration, however, was not expected. The fungal cells were found to form a very elaborate and interconnecting network, which enabled effective communication amongst each other and to exchange nutrients. Through this process, the ant's brain, rather than being taken over like what would be thought of and what gives cordyceps a nickname of the zombie fungi, is not the most accurate, as the brain is more so cut off from the rest of their functionings, effectively being controlled against their will by the fungi. With their brain cut off, the fungi sends out chemical signals to control the ant's musculature functions, making them flex in real time as to where the ant should go, or while the ant is generally aware but can't do anything about the fungi once they start to take more of a hold. With the fungi now in control of the ant's movements, it makes the ant move to higher ground, making them climb up onto a leaf or stalk around 10 to 25 centimeters off the ground to give the upcoming new spores a greater chance to spread. To increase these odds, the fungi induces another form of control, in where they break apart the membranes that covers their jaw muscle fibres through their fungal compounds, which forces them to latch on tightly to a given area, typically in the major vein on the underside of a leaf, where the ant and the fungi will remain together for about 4 to 10 days before the ant eventually dies. In that time, the fungi continues to incubate, and eventually, fruiting bodies emerge from the ant's head, which then ruptures to release more spores, which fall down on any unsuspecting ants beneath them on the forest floor. 
When these ants die, they are found mainly in regions containing a high density of other individuals which were themselves also manipulated and killed by the fungi, often transported away by members of their own species so that the spores don't infect the rest of their colony. That, or the fungus will move the ant away from the colony themselves. Cordyceps itself isn't entirely without its own threats though, as they are also vulnerable to other types of fungal infections themselves, which helps to form a balance in the ecosystem as to how plentiful they can be. They're also known to have been around a long time doing what they do to ants and other insects since at least the Eocene epoch around 48 million years ago, where marks on the leaves from the Messel pit in Germany, which preserves the environment from said time in immaculate detail, has turned up leaves which have very similar marks on them, almost certainly caused by prehistoric ants also inflicted with said fungus. With all of this being said, how similar are the cordyceps that inspired the ones seen in The Last of Us, both the game and the show, and from there, is it possible that they could indeed spread to people if we're not careful? The base premise of the series being that increasing global temperatures meant that the fungi could make the jump from ants all the way up to people right off the bat is pretty implausible, especially under the time frame it takes place, is already a main preventer for infection, and even if one was able to cause a small infection, the machinery that is needed for them to spread in the precise ways that they do is simply not there. Insects have a much more rudimentary and easy to control system than we do, as well as having a much lower body temperature, and with many species only being able to infect one type of insect, not at all being generalists, the jump to even another insect species, let alone to any mammal like us, is an absurdity. Even with most viruses, bacteria and fungi, host switches occur only a handful of times, even among wide ranging forms. Even when we take a brisk walk, we inhale thousands of fungal spores routinely, which does not cause problems in people. This is because of our aforementioned immune systems and body temperatures, not to mention that if some actually harmful fungi end up in our foods, they are often immediately killed either by microwaving or by the low pH in our stomachs. If a transfer were indeed to happen, in spite of the immense evolutionary pressures needed and a near universal genomic restructuring, spreading through other mammals first and foremost would make the most sense with animals like mice and monkeys being exposed, and then, with their similarity, would make it a lot easier for it to spread to people. Of course, this would be a much longer process than seen in the show, mutations on such a level are infinitesimally small, but the show at least doesn't take this position. Instead, the fungi made the jump to weeds and thereby flower, and from there, becoming able to parasitise people. A jump that not only happens from ants to plants, a whole other kingdom of life, and then somehow to people, is not at all a plausible thing, and is not something that's been observed on such a level. Even if this did happen in our world, it wouldn't be the species ending events if it did. For one, Cordyceps doesn't turn its host into a ravenous version of themselves, going around and attacking other members of their species to spread their spores, instead doing the opposite and leading the host away to a secluded area, away from others of their kind, and only becoming hazardous at that point whereby said host becomes immobile when the fungi reaches an optimal environment. A wholesale decline in people, like what's seen in The Last of Us, would also be very detrimental to the fungi as well, since while their infection is 100% lethal, their goal isn't to convert as many ants as possible into some kind of army to take over. If that were to happen, their host would become increasingly rare and more fragmented, which would inevitably lead to their own extinction. And, as is the case for any species, that's the last thing they want evolutionarily. The whole process of the fungi taking over is also something that takes days or weeks, sometimes even months to occur, and is far from an instant process. The spreading of fungi because of heightened global temperatures is however definitely a thing, and while not being a concern in the case of cordyceps, sure is the case for other fungi. Fungal infections are a very real thing, often through skin infections, and if you're immunocompromised, certain spores that are normally benign can settle in our lungs and cause an issue. Candida auris is one of the most notable genera, being able to spread from person to person and infecting the bloodstream, being able to cause severe infections. Common from yeast infections, it is often anti-drug resistant and so remains as a big threat should it not be contained properly. Up to 1.7 million people worldwide are killed by fungi each year, and with the increased contact with them through our encroachments on these fungi populations, our exposure to them will therefore increase, and how we deal with that is absolutely something we need to consider going forward. It is unlikely that fungi could cause a global pandemic on the same scale that we saw with COVID, as fungi spread through direct skin-to-skin -skin contacts rather than through droplets, though still, with the effects they can cause, monitoring them and their spreads is very key. So while not being a potentially society-ending species like how The Last of Us shows, Cordyceps is still an especially fascinating fungi, and with all of what we know, are also quite tasty. 
Before getting to that, on the health side, cordyceps and other related species are known to engage in an active secondary metabolism, and among other things, all for the production of substances, active as antibacterial agents that protect the fungus host's ecosystem against further pathogenesis during fungal reproduction. Because of this secondary metabolism, an interest in the species has been taken by chemists, with the discovery of small molecule agents being a potential interest for use as human immunomodularity and anti-cancer agents. They have often been used in traditional Chinese medicines to varying effects, with them being found to support kidney function, lowering creatinine levels and cholesterol, with eating it in chicken noodle soup, and even in sandwiches being a popular option. Through The Last of Us, even with some of the flaws brought up earlier, the appreciation for and acknowledgement of fungi and the role they do play in our environment has surely gone up, and that is a great boon for a recognition and understanding of them and how they impact our world. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these fungi and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.